Good morning. I'm uh, Pete Luann, and, and what I'm going to show you today is just a, a small part of a course that I teach uh, that we've developed, and it's uh, Managing Brownfield Projects. It's FPM 42, and you'll see all that at the very end of the session, okay? Um, so I want to talk about brownfield projects and turnarounds, because brownfield projects when you do all your times and all that, they're all normally associated with a turnaround, okay? So, uh, now one of the things that we have to do is um, I'll let you read that. Um, you know, it's, it, it's something that we're required to do, so go ahead and read it at your leisure. Actually, you probably won't be able to take too much time because I'm going to flip the slide right now. All right. So, um, so I'm going to let Clay talk about this, okay? So, Clay? Yeah, as I mentioned, uh, you'll see the uh, chat window, um, the little icon in the top right of your screen, uh, and then the participant icon as well. Click those. That's where you can raise your hand, um, type in questions. So that's what it should look like on your screen. Uh, and again, just feel free to let me know if you have any issues. Okay, thank you. All right, so um, so here's what we want to talk about. You know, really, um, my focus is on helping you succeed in your projects, not only your projects, but in your career. In this one short hour that we're going to have together, we'll, we'll just be able to talk about a very small piece of this. Uh, just to give you a very brief background on myself, you know, I've managed projects, petrochemical and upstream projects for about 30 years. In the last 15 years or so, I've consulted on capital projects, okay? So the material you're gonna see here I've developed, and it's basically, it's material that I use with my clients, okay? So it's, it's not pie in the sky, and it's stuff that, that actually works and people actually use. Okay, so now, one of the challenges that we have when we do a, a virtual session like this is, is that there's no back and forth, okay? And, that, and that's very unfortunate uh, because the way people learn is by listening to everybody's questions, a lot of discussion. You know, unfortunately, we're not going to get a chance to do that. So one of the things we want to talk about is what are the objectives of the day, okay? Why brownfield projects are a challenge? Uh, unique activities and deliverables of a brownfield project, and most important, how to overcome brownfield project challenge, the, the biggest brownfield project challenges, which are basically surprises during a turnaround. That's the gotcha associated with these projects. So we're gonna, that's going to be the focus of this session today, what we call due diligence, okay? And due diligence is really unique to brownfield projects. You know, I don't know that you'll see it anywhere if you pick up any books on project management. Um, and basically, I just coined that term because it really adequately describes what you as a project engineer, project manager, need to do to minimize surprises. You're not ever going to be able to get rid of them, okay? But it's what you need to do to minimize them. So the first thing we want to start out with, um, if I were in a room with you and I asked you, you know, how many of you work on Brownfield Project, I would guess that just about everybody would raise their hand, okay? So one of the things we always talk about is, okay, so what's the difference between a Greenfield and a Brownfield Project, okay? So I'll let you read the items there in a Greenfield Project, okay? The project is ring fenced, okay? New plant design with condition fully known because you're starting with a clean slate. Uh, the project team manages basically everything. Minimal impact from non-project team controlled projects. Projects are schedule-centric, meaning they're schedule-driven. And we only introduce hydrocarbons at the last minute at startup. And probably the most important thing, and, and I'm, I'm sure we have some operations people, you know, in our audience, and I don't want anybody to take offense at this, but if you're a project manager and you're or project engineer, you're doing a brownfield project. The I'll use the term the, loosely. The neighborhood you're working in is one controlled by operations, and I think everybody would agree to that 
You cannot do anything on that site without concurrence and going through a process with operations, which is as it should be, okay? So what I'm saying is that that adds a significant level of complexity and challenge to you as a project engineer, project manager for Brownfield Project. So you look on the right-hand side, Brownfield Project, manage linkage between existing facilities, the ops organization, and what you're going to build, okay? So you got three main, you got the challenge you have is what's out there, working with operations and maintenance, and it's only a challenge because, you know, they drive the work schedule, okay? Uh, current plant condition is unknown, okay? You know, how many times have we thought, hey, this heat exchanger is in good shape or this vessel is in, in pretty good shape? That's what the last inspection showed when you open it up, and it's a mess, okay? Um, and a lot of times you won't find out until you open something up. So what does this do? That changes the project scope, okay? And it changes the project scope at probably the worst possible time, and that's when the thing is, the unit is shut down, the work's to be done, and you open something up and all of a sudden you decide you don't have what you need. You must integrate the project with maintenance operation as they drive the schedule and they control the resources. And we say the projects are event-centric, okay, because things occur not only in what you find but in, in issues that operations or maintenance may uncover during the turnaround. And then safety issues, SIMOPS, I think everybody's aware of this. I won't go into that into detail. And probably uh, one that is absolutely critical, if you're going to be successful at this, those of you that work in existing facilities know you have to manage operations and maintenance interface. Okay. So why don't we go on? All right. So th this gives you an idea of what of where, very candidly, a project engineer, project manager that's doing a brownfield project, where you sit in the hierarchy with respect to a shutdown or turnaround. So if you think about it, who typically runs the thing, the turnaround? You know, depending on the size of your unit, you can have somebody from the turnaround group or it could be a, a program manager, and that program manager, you know, may be a very senior operations person, okay? There is a, uh, a program strategy, meaning, you know, the thing may be a, uh, a two-week turnaround. Then a WBS, a work breakdown structure, i.e., these are the things that are going to need to be done. Then the, the plan, okay? And typically, it's a very detailed schedule, you know, a lot of times detailed to the the half, the half out, excuse me, uh, the half day, or I'll say like a, a four hour cycle. And then success criteria and project metrics, then the PMs, and then these are projects, and, and I don't mind saying this, they're at the very bottom of the pyramid, okay? Not because they form the basis for everything that the program manager does, but I mean, this, this is where we sit in, in the priority, okay? And then and we have to see to all these other things, but I mean, this is life, okay? And you can see there, um, the bottom bullet there, operations has priority over everything, okay? If so, because the reason that they shut things down is what? It's to maintain production, right? It's to, excuse me, to maintain surety of production in the future, to maintain to ensure that you have, um, that all the proper maintenance is done required on a shutdown. That's why, that's why the turnarounds are done, as you all well know. Okay, so, so here's some of the challenges, okay, of a brownfield project. Unknown facility condition, and we're gonna talk a lot about that. You don't know oftentimes what the condition of the facility is. Even operations and maintenance often do not know, and they live there. I mean, they spend their life, their working lives there in that processing unit, integration with other projects. So just like you're managing this project, 
as you well know, there are other project engineers, project managers that are also trying to get their brownfield project done, you know, at the same time. And as some of you have probably seen this in the past, you go out, you take some dimensions and drawings, and, and you generate some drawings, and you fabricate everything, and then you come out there to do the installation, and somebody has done a project basically over your installation and change some things, and that's, that's the nature of the beast. Now, there are ways to mitigate that. Operations, work priorities, facility environment issues, simultaneous operations, changing work scope, demolition. Okay, so these are the things that you, as a project engineer, project manager, managing a brownfield project, have to manage. Okay, so very quickly, we're going to focus on the one at the top, unknown facility condition. Okay, this just kind of gives you an overview. All right, the other thing I want to talk about before we get into what we call due diligence is that I know that there are several Chevron people uh, on the call, and even those that are non-Chevron people, I think most folks have some type of a stage gate system to execute their capital projects. And the stages are typically appraise, select, define, okay, and then after you get funding, you execute the project, okay? The, the challenge with brownfield projects is that there's a whole series of things that need to be done on top of or that overlay a typical stage gate process. Okay, and the, and the reason is because you're, you have an existing situation and you're trying to integrate new work with that existing situation as opposed to just a greenfield project, okay? That's the complexity. So what I'm showing you here is in the appraised phase, we have what, what we feel you need to do is to have a successful project, you need to do due diligence. Okay, uh, and this is really the core, probably the most important thing in a brownfield project, okay? Because if you don't get this, you're gonna be susceptible to a lot of surprises, okay? And so here's some, and, and I'm gonna show you a case study um, toward the end of the session and an actual output from, uh, from one of the classes, and I, it's a high-level output, but it'll give me an idea of what the thing looks like, and it's all it's gonna do. So for due diligence, basically, and we'll talk about these in detail, data collection, as-built drawings, historical operating data, inspection reports, incidents and accidents, okay? What's the historical maintenance on the unit or the vessel? Pipeline locations, underground issues, permits and issues. What kind of permits are you potentially going to have to have, you know, when you're working out there? So these are all extra items over and above uh, your typical stage gate process. And then and we'll, I'm, I'll briefly go through these other stages. Now you have to integrate your brownfield project with the existing facility. And so you see some of the things there, and I won't read them all off. Make sure you have all the, um, the, the infrastructure and utilities, power, and all that. Make sure it integrates properly into the existing facility. You know, line pressure loss, you know, all those access, all those things. And then planning or define, or some people refer to it as front-end engineering development or feed. And then you see all these other things. Has op, decommissioning. You're gonna to have to demo something, probably. Remediation plan, if you have soil that you need to manage. Then waste, if it's, and think about offshore, waste management. You know, as you well know, I mean, all that stuff needs to be hauled off. Air emissions. Facility effluent plan. So you've got to do something with the effluent plan, with the effluent, um, if you start blowing things down. And then post shutdown, okay? Um, and I tell you what, <clears throat> we won't talk about that. I mean, you can just have a look at it. 
you know, due to time constraint. All right. So uh, here's basically the, the process. So I want to talk about due diligence now. Okay. So due diligence is, is, you know, I've broken it up into three major categories, okay? And these three categories are death studies, site investigation, and site works, okay? Now, uh, if you look at the progression here, and it's done intentionally like this, okay? Um, death studies are, you know, we call on that because these are things you, you ought to do back at the office, okay? And you should spend a lot of time doing these death studies. Now, as you'll see in just a little bit, the work can be quite, uh, quite onerous. I mean, there can be a lot of it, okay? Um, in site investigation, you're basically confirming all the death studies. And if you can't find something out from site investigation, another way to find it, then typically you gotta do site works. And a lot of times that involves excavation, okay? So you see what the progression is? Death studies, you know, not very intrusive. Site investigation, a little bit more intrusive. And then site works, definitely intrusive, okay? All right, so uh, here's another way to show this. So you have due diligence at the top. You have the three major categories, uh, death studies, site investigation, and then of course, site works. Okay, now now something I wanna talk about is, I've, this death studies, I've broken it up into a couple of categories. Operational, it's typically um, operational, operational con conditions, and then as-is condition. In other words, what does that plant look like if I were to go out there, okay? Then the site investigation basically confirms, or you're trying to confirm, you're trying to validate everything that you found in death study, right? And we've got a couple of categories, cursory and detailed, and then the last one is site works, and we'll talk about that in a minute, okay? So, you know, instead of giving you a big list of things, you gotta do, you know, A through Z or whatever, you know, if we can break this up, the due diligence, if we can break up due diligence into bite-sized chunk that makes sense, okay? If things make sense to us, it's better for us when we're trying to execute the plan and just as important, if not more important, it helps us sell it to our manager and just as important, if not more important, it helps us sell it to operations, okay? And I think it's, you know, I, I started my career, you know, working in a petrochemical plant. And, and, you know, I always felt sorry for the ops guys because they worked late hours, they had tremendous demands, and people were always asking them for something, you know? And, you know, and after a while, it would, you know, I did feel sorry for the guy. But what this does is that, this gives you a very logical approach and you can make a good case if you if you want to do something, okay? Like, and uh, say you want to open, take a very mini shutdown to open up a vessel, okay? You wanna take a mini shutdown and maybe, or maybe take something out of service for maybe a couple of hours or maybe half a day and uh, you know, and if you go and you ask the ops person, they're probably gonna tell you no, unless you have not only a valid reason, but you can document these things, okay? And maybe you wanna take that quick shutdown, that quick turnaround or whatever, take that vessel out of service, so you can make sure you're fully prepared for when the turnaround comes around, okay? So we're gonna go through this, okay. All right, so uh, due diligence, okay? And this is operational. Okay, so in your office, like this young lady's working in her office, what you wanna do is you wanna get access to the plant operating data, historical operating parameters, all the process materials that are utilized out there, incident and accident history, historical maintenance. I wanna ask you this, historical operating parameters, if you think about it, you look at those parameters, 
and compare them with their plant operating data, and you see that there have been, you're interested in a particular heat exchanger, okay? And uh, you see it's got a high pressure drop across it, you know, that probably tells you something. Or you see that there have been substantial temperature excursions, that also tells you something, okay? Um, incident and accident history, if you're working in an area of the plant where there have been numerous, I'll use the word, events, you know, that, that, that should tell you something also. And the historical maintenance information. Um, you know, how has the unit been maintained? Okay. Um, that, of course, is, would be of importance to you. That gives you an idea of what you're going to find when you open it up. Okay. And, uh, oh, I forgot to talk about it. Um, you know, uh, inspection reports also for uh, at the operational level. You know, has a thing been inspected or the last, say, uh, in the last five years, what do the inspection reports look like? You know, has the vessel wall been thinning continuously? Well, that would, that would show you a trend. Or, you know, everything looks fine. Or maybe the thing hasn't been inspected. The idea is to gain as much, and I'll use this word, intelligence about the unit that you're going to work on or that's involved in your project before you ever do your design. Remember, this happens at the very first stage in the appraised stage before you, before you ever start to design the facility. Then what we call as-is condition, okay? Uh, uh, as-is condition, plant layout and accessibility, as built drawings, equipment and line inspection reports, okay, plant history timeline, and I guess I talked about this a little earlier. Plant history timeline, including re revamps, modifications, shutdown, underground instructions, obstructions, permits, and issues. Again, you know, you wanna you wanna know everything about the so previously we wanna know. Uh, what the operational history is of the facility. Now we want to know when we go out there, what are we going to find? Do we have good drawings? Is it accessible? Can we get into it? All those kind of things. Okay. Now, due diligence level two. Okay. So now we've done all the due diligence we need to at the, at the office. Now we're going out to the job site. Okay, and on the job site, what we want to do is everything that we found working in our office, we want to confirm, okay? So cursory, process data gathering, confirm access to equipment. I tell you what, the best source of any kind of information, and I think everybody would agree to this, is existing operations and maintenance staff. They live there. So you, you really need to spend a lot of time with them, with all of your questions, with all of the data that you gathered before as to the potential condition of the, of the facility where you're going to be working. Do any visual inspection. Can you get access to it? Uh, you know, all these things, really what you're trying to do, you're trying to avoid surprises, okay? And more so than that, remember, this is the very first stage of your project, okay? So not only do you need to design it, but how are you gonna build the thing, okay? And then detailed, well, uh, level two, and this is detailed, okay? Confirm the all the as, one, do you have as built, okay? And as you will know, for a lot of these sites, we'll call them legacy sites or sites that have been around, facilities that have been around a while, you know, you don't always have as-built drawing, uh, so that is absolutely critical. Um, ultrasound for, for thickness testing or integrity, uh, ground penetrating radar, you see the gentleman pushing something that looks like kind of like a fancy lawnmower, but that's a GPR unit. Smart pigs, uh, uh, point, point cloud laser surveys. I know that some of my clients 
have done uh, point cloud laser surveys on some of their entire facilities, and these are large, I'll just say either refineries or petrochemical units uh, here in the U.S., and that way they know where everything, you know, XYZ coordinates for everything. And I tell you what, I mean, this is pretty inexpensive. Um, I know this is being done, or a lot of the offshore facilities are in the process of doing this. It, it's a lot cheaper than it ever used to be. But again, this is data, and this is data that will help you let you fabricate things off-site instead of trying to fabricate on-site. Um, and it's basically conf confirming what you're trying to do. You're trying to confirm everything that you found in your, in your work area, okay? And then the last thing, okay, is if you can't find – if you can't confirm everything that you need to do, then you may need to do some work, okay? Uh, excavations is a typical one. I think I, I talked earlier about uh, putting a vessel or a heat exchanger out of service for a short period of time so you can take a quick look um, or do a, a quick test on something. But I tell you what, it's going to be very difficult to do any of those things unless you have a good reason for it, other than I think we ought to do it. But I'll tell you what, if you sit down with the operations manager or unit manager or maintenance manager or your boss and you say, hey, here are the things I've looked at. You have all the data that you know we've talked about. Uh, you've confirmed all these things. And then you say, the only way we can find out is if we do, like in this case, excavation. Otherwise, we're taking a risk. And if you're prepared to take the risk, then that's fine. Okay. So the, only th the other thing I want to ask you is, you know, if you go to your boss or whomever and you, sh you share with them all these things that you've done, okay, and I know you can't hold up your hand, and of course, and I can't see it, but, uh, you know, I'll ask you, what kind of an impression do you think this is going to make on the operations maintenance people and your manager? I said, hey, you know, this individual, my way of thinking, this individual has really thought this through instead of, you know, running in here with their hair on fire saying, you know, we need to start digging a bunch of holes out the operating, out the pipe alley in the operating unit. Okay. All right. So these are the things we just talked about. Okay, now, here's some more due diligence items. Some of these are offshore, like you see there off to your right, POB or personnel on board, but these are things that you have to, uh, you really have to look at. Some of these things we've talked about, some of them we haven't, but look, uh, operating manuals, procedures, material hazards, methods to manage, you know, what do the internals of a vessel look like? Alarm details. We've already talked about passing inspection and testing report. Lifting equipment. You know, can we, what kind of lifting equipment do we need to get in there, and do we have access? The other thing is lay-down areas. Do we have the lay-down area, i.e., where we can put pipe spools that have been fabricated or a vessel that we're being replaced, that's being replaced, you know, that we can set that there? And of course, for those of you that work offshore, POB or personnel on board, i.e., do you have enough beds? Very critical. And there you see their other shutdown work. Okay, so I tell you what, I know we've been talking about this in a theoretical sense. And if, if you're like me, you really want to see some uh, uh, something in real life. Okay, so what I'm going to show you now, okay? One of the things that we do is, and listen, this is a lot of stuff here, okay, but I've just highlighted things, okay? We do what we call a red thread exercise or a case study for this course, okay? And this is like about a 30-page a case study, all right? And uh, one, of the, one of the exercises that we do that we spend a lot of time on is on due diligence, okay? So here's the setting for this, and we try to make it as real life as possible. And to tell you the truth, when I put these case studies together, 
it's based on things that I saw, you know, when I was managing projects in a plant as a young engineer or things I hear from my clients. It, it's basically an amalgam of all those things. So in this particular case, and I'm not going to read everything, but I, I've highlighted some important things. You're a brand new project manager, okay? And again, this is a case study. So, so should you choose to come to this course, and I'm not trying to sell a course, I'm just trying to tell you, share with you how, how we go through the learning process is that we present a situation where you're the project manager, okay, you've just been assigned a new project, you want to make a good impression, and here's your employer, Hotshot Exploration and Production, okay, so they just drilled, and they've got a good well, apparently, and the new well is going to be tied to an existing platform, Tiger 3, and your boss, the VP of Capital Projects, assigns this project to you, so this is a classical brownfield project, an existing platform, and you'll see in a little bit, it's an old, old platform, and you're tying in a new well, okay? And you see here, um, Tiger 3 is a fairly old platform, and it is near the end of its useful life. And we, get, we provide a bunch of conditions here, okay? And the conditions are not important other than when you're working the project. Okay, so the asset manager, Asset manager is typically the one, and everybody has a different term, but they're basically the ones that own the asset, are responsible for the profit and loss of the facility. And typically, here, let me see, I think I've got an org chart here. Let's see, uh, yeah, the asset manager, you see who reports into them. Operations, production engineering, actually uh, maintenance, and then drilling. So they own the asset, okay? We're project managers, so we sit over here under the BP Capital Project. Okay, so, so here's some typical situations. The VP of Operations promised his boss he's gonna get the new well on production in six months. So I'm guessing from your experience, you know that that's probably not only not very likely, it's probably impossible, okay? But, uh, and I'll say this very much tongue in cheek, you know, all of us have worked in these, in, um, in E&P organizations or downstream organizations, and very candidly, you know, uh, people get very exuberant and they get excited about some things and sometimes they, they can't overpromise, okay? But, but this is part of the challenge of this project, okay? I mean, it's supposed to be real life. The VP of Capital Projects, your, pro, your boss, okay? Projects in the past, past have overrun and extended platform shutdowns and extended platform shutdowns due to unforeseen issues. Projects has not always had a good working relationship with the asset manager and in particular the operation. Okay, all right. So then you go to the operations engineer, okay? The ops engineer, and you see the well test and all that. So they only tested the well for four hours. Okay, so those of you with an upstream background, and I know you can't respond, that's a red flag, obviously. I mean, I mean that is a huge red flag, okay? Plus, they're not sure about the composition of the well, okay? Now, the platform operations manager, the POM, or basically this is the ops person for the platform, okay? Now, all of you have worked with operations people, and I tell you, when I was working in a facility where not for the operations people, my projects would have never been successful or, you know, they would have just done horribly, okay? So you really have to work with them. But you know, operations people, they work in that area, okay? It's their home, all right? Their safety depends on it, all right? So, you know, I'm sure everybody has heard the term of urban renewal and, you know, it, it's, it's a known fact. And, and it's, it's, not, um, it's not a pejorative term, but they want it fixed up, okay? So this is something that you as a project manager are gonna to have to handle, okay? 
And that's, this is addressed in other exercises. But here's some things that they tell you. The existing glycol unit is working, but it's just barely making dew point. The DCS is old, okay? No software upgrades. Three-phase separator has had problems. And the existing deck crane is marginal. Now, you're tying in a new well, right? So as a minimum, you're going to need these items, okay? You will need these items, okay? Uh, and then you see some other items that, you know, that have some challenges there. Diesel driver, you know, on fire water pump that is not doing well, okay? Platform safety engineer, the existing platform is not maintained well, and they had several incidents during the last shutdown. And the commercial manager, I know no one has ever heard this, they, they, we have not, here's what the commercial manager says, we have not signed a gas sales agreement, but there should be no problem getting one executed. Okay, well, just think about that. I'm not gonna make any comments on that. The, your project manager, project engineer, you need technical people, right? So you go to the engineering manager and what do they tell you? Short on staff and they don't have a process engineer, you need a process engineer, okay? And then the construction manager, I didn't highlight that, but you're, this is offshore, you're gonna need some kind of work barge. Well, I tell you, this individual tells you you're not gonna get one in the time frame that you want one in. And then to further complicate these things, in the next six months, you're gonna be in the middle of the monsoon season, okay? So I'm guessing this is somewhere in uh, Southeast Asia. Um, it's going to be quite difficult to do anything. All right, so those are the challenges for this project, okay, for this Brownfield project. And recall, you have to tie in that new well, okay? This is a block diagram of the platform. Inlet separate, very typical inlet for separation, whether it's onshore or offshore. Dehydrate the gas, export compression, you export it. Inlet separation, condensate pumps, you export the condensate, and then produce water and water disposal. And we already talked about these things, and this is where you, the project manager, fit into the hierarchy, okay? So, um, and I know I can't see you folks, but I, I think when I, when I teach this to class, I think most everybody agrees, wow, this is fairly typical, or this is a challenging project. So the question is, is how do we apply due diligence here? Okay, well, how do we apply what I just talked about, you know, for about 30 minutes or so? Okay, so I'm gonna show you, and this is a result that the class put together for, for, for everyone, okay? Now, you'll see three categories, desktop studies, site investigation, preliminary site work. Okay, now desktop studies, remember it was comprised of two categories, operation and as-is condition, okay? Now, if you look at this, this is really high level, okay? It, it is, okay? Um, but if you look at the things, and it's because of the way the, 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 um, the case study is written, but if you're doing your particular project, okay? You know, use a spreadsheet like this and for the area of the plant you're working on. So if you have to replace, say, uh, an agitator on a vessel, okay? So what's the, oper what is, somebody's gotta look at all the operational data, so how far back are you gonna go? You know, somebody's responsible for it and what, what, what's gonna be the data source? That, you look at historical operating parameters, process materials, you know, all of these things, and plant layout and accessibility for the as-is condition. So, you know, can you get a, um, a, something to lift the equipment in there? Do we have as-built drawings, underground obstructions? What specific permits are gonna be required? And any history or shutdowns, okay? So what this does, is that at your at the office level, it gives you a pretty good 
background of what you can expect to find when you go out to the field or when you install this piece of equipment. Now, I'll grant you, depending on the size of your project, this is a lot of work, a lot of work, okay? So, uh, you know, it's not unusual at all to depend on our contractor partners to help us with this. Not at all unusual, okay? Um, all right. So then you take all of this data from desk studies and you go out to the field. That's why we call it site investigation. And remember, we talked about cursory and detail. So cursory, you're, you're confirming everything that uh, all the data that you, that you uh, gathered, you confirm access, <coughs> excuse me, you do an overall inspection. And remember the key thing in here, <coughs> excuse me, you have lengthy discussions with operations and maintenance. And they, listen, then the operations people, they're gonna wanna help you, okay? They don't wanna see the, the, the turnaround or the shutdown extended any more than you do. And plus, they want the equipment up and running, okay? They don't wanna shut down because of this. So, I think uh, clearly if you approach them the right way, you, you should not have any problems. You should, especially if you have done all this work, okay? And then the detailed work, you've got supposedly as-built drawings, then you need to, <coughs> excuse me, you need to confirm all those, okay? Which means uh, maybe you need to do a laser point cloud survey or an under, a GPR, ground penetrator and radar survey or, survey or anything like that. So you see, this is all a fair amount of work, okay? <laughs> Excuse me. All right, and then the very last thing, if nothing else works, in this particular case, um, there was some concern about the geotechnical work there the geotechnical data, so they had to hire a contractor to do, you know, to take soil samples, see how much asbestos was out on the platform, and all these other things. But this is really the last thing that you want to do, okay? Okay, so um, let's see what else. Okay, so, so let's go. So right now, what I'd like to do is, um, I've taken up about 45 minutes of your time, and I'd, I'd like to open it up to questions. If somebody has any questions, if you've submitted them or you w want to submit them, you know, you want to submit them, I'm, I'll be more than happy to answer them for you. Hey, Pete, um, we've got a few questions here. Uh, and again, if anyone else has other questions, uh, please type them into the chat and I will hand them off to Pete. Uh, okay. So the first question here is, is this Brownfield project the same as the PDCA cycle process? Yeah, I'm sorry, I'm not familiar with the PDCA cycle process. If you could tell me what that means. Okay, if you've got more details on that for whoever submitted that question, just type them into yeah. the chat and we'll address that. Yeah. Um, the next question is, in an industry environment with high turnover, uh, how does this change management of brownfield projects or turnarounds? Well, you know, all of this is, you know, since I Hopefully, that you know, we've been able, everybody will agree that brownfield projects are much, much more of a challenge than greenfield. I mean, they really are. Not only organizationally, but also uh, the fact, you know, the existing condition of the facility, you're going into a neighborhood where you don't know what the condition is of anything, okay? Uh, I would say it's, you know, for the project engineer, uh, you know, I would say it's probably more of a challenge because for those of you that work in a, on brownfield projects in a facility, it's so much about working relationships with operations and maintenance and everybody else in the facility. It's, it's very, very much that. So, you know, with respect to turnover, uh, it probably, something like this was certainly exacerbated, okay? Okay. 
Okay, and uh, we do have some more details here on the PDCA. So the Plant Do Check Act. Um, oh, Plant Do Check Act. Okay, yeah. yes, thank you. And I think somebody uh, sent that to me. Yeah, you know, the, I say you know the Plant Do Check Act. I, you know, Plant Do Check, and there's nothing wrong with Plant Do Check Act. Okay, Plant Do Check Act really works for anything and everything. I, I would say it's a uh, you know, say for instance, if uh, it, if you're planning a vacation, okay, and uh, you know you you plan your trip, you know you put together an itinerary and all that, and then you check to see that you have hotel reservations, plan, you know, with plan, yeah. So you, you plan a trip, and then uh, you make all your reservations, and then if you want to check, say the day before you leave, you check on them and act, and you get in the car and you take off, okay? So, um, you know, this is just one subset of PDCA. I mean, it's really all that it is, okay? It certainly doesn't contravene Plan to Check Act. Gotcha. Okay, uh, next question here is, what seems to be a reasonable level of contingency to plan for with a brownfield versus greenfield project? Yeah, I tell you what, I don't know who I don't know who asked that, but that is an excellent question. Excellent. Okay, and I get that asked at at every single one of these sessions. Okay, um, first let me say this. Okay. Uh, when whoever's planning this turnaround, they should have work that they're immediately ready to pull out, okay, and delete if other work surfaces, like potentially your project, okay? Uh, inherently, these carry a lot more risk, okay, because you have a very short period, a very short time frame to do the work. So a lot of time, things that tend to happen is, uh, operations would tend to throw a lot of resources. Would tend to throw a lot of resources at it. Okay, so I tell you, if normally, and, and I hate to give out numbers, you know, if normally for a capital project, a greenfield project, for whatever reason, you may want to have ten or fifteen percent. You know, it, it's certainly. I like to say this for a greenfield project. If you're running ten, fifteen, many twenty percent, it needs to be much higher than that, okay? It really does. Now, one of the things that you need to do is when you do this, when you put the thing together, is what can help, help you with contingency is list the potential risk, okay? Like we open up the vessel and it needs to be replaced. Well, that's obviously not in your cost estimate. And I'd list it as a risk and then indicate the cost impact. Okay, that's your best protection. In other words, open it up to management and operations so they can see where are the potential impacts if some of these events can occur. And they do happen. They absolutely do. Okay. And in some cases, no matter, you know, if, if you're doing, you know, a million dollar job and typically you would put maybe a 20% contingency, they're not ever going to believe you if you ask for another million. If that's what it would cost to put in a new vessel, they're going to say you're panning it, and rightly so. So what you do is you, you list a line item. We open this thing up, and we need to replace a vessel, or we need a new agitator. And you price those items out so they can see for themselves what could potentially happen. And that's basically to protect you and manage operations and manage management. All right. Uh, the next question here is, do you feel the regulatory bodies play an important role in the life cycle of the process? Uh, so, for example, to enforce the transfer of operational data to a new operator taking over the brownfield? Yes, yes. It, listen, you're absolutely right. Uh, you know, we're doing things now that when I first started working a long time ago, you never concerned yourself with op with trans making sure operational data was secure and that you you passed it over to a new operator. Or, you know, when I first started doing projects, you know, this will kind of tell you something, we didn't do management of change. Now, 
man, you can't do, you cannot change a set point on a controller without going through MOC. So yes, and a lot of that is driven by, you know, more robust industry standards, and certainly uh, by by government and regulatory uh, initiatives. All right. Uh, the next query that came in, uh, uh, how do you deal with poor scope definition uh, and scope creep? And do you have any tips or resources for that? This came in from multiple people in, in, uh, in a few different variations. Sure, and listen, that always comes up in these, any project course that I teach is how do you manage scope creep? Uh, how do you manage variation orders? What were the things that you mentioned there, Clay? Scope creep, what else did you say? Uh, and poor scope definition. Poor scope definition, okay. All right, so uh, two things, okay. Um, scope creep and poor scope definition, especially scope creep, okay. Scope creep for those of you that work in a facility is difficult to manage, why? Because I think maybe I've made a big deal of, about how you have to have a good working relationship with operations and maintenance. And, you know, you know, I used to do this, and they'll ask you for stuff, you know. And you can't really tell, no, I'm not going to do this. I don't have the money. Well, that's fine. But next time you want something from them, they're not going to tell you anything, right? So uh, what I have done, in the, what I counsel my uh, clients is, one, you need to have a change management process, not management of change, but a change management process, okay? Uh, and what that means is that you need, you, basically what you tell them is, I, I need a change order, okay? And so we, if you have that, that's your app, and you say, hey, I think it's a great idea, I'm happy to do it, but I gotta get my boss to approve it, okay? So then you just take it to your, well, first of all, you gotta get, if somebody in op, typically somebody in ops will want, will want this change item, okay? So what you do is you go to that, you, you tell the ops person, says, I need a change order, I need your boss to sign it, okay? So that's the first hurdle. And then you give it to your boss and he's gotta sign it. And so that way, you're not the bad guy or the bad person, somebody, it's, it's in somebody else's control. And if they're okay with it, then you're fine with it, okay? All right, so it's, so the other thing is, okay, manage poor scope definition. I tell you, uh, poor scope definition, uh, and I hate to lay a lot of this at the feet of operations, okay, but, and, and some of it is engineering also, but, you know, operations tends to be, um, because of the way they are, you know, they need to keep the unit running, and that's all, that's what they care about. You, running and running safely, okay? So, you know, I've seen work orders that say, you know, install one pump, okay? Well, what does that mean, all right? So basically, poor scope definition, you have to sit down and write a scope document, okay? You write everything that's going to, and in the absence of having this in a class, I mean, you know, we have tools that, that we go through this in class, but you write line by line what's going to be provided, okay? And then and you have a then you then you develop drawings, okay? And you get everybody to sign off on the drawings, on the data sheets, on the scope document, okay? They have to sign off on it, not an email, not verbal, nothing like that, because that's when you get scope creep, you get poor scope definition, okay? So it's got to be documented. And I know it sounds like a pain in the behind, but, but that's the only way to protect yourself, ladies and gentlemen. Because uh, ultimately, if this project goes south or if you overrun it or, who's, or if it's late, who gets blamed or who gets the credit? You do. You're the project manager, okay? So I don't know if you want to call it tough love or whatever, but 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 you have to take that approach, okay? Go ahead, Clay. All right, uh, one last call for any questions. Go ahead and type them in the chat if you have any additional ones. Uh, just a reminder, uh, we will send 
uh, the recording of this out, including the full presentation and the question and answer section. Um, another question that has come in here is, do you have any tips for good planning? So in the, the planning uh, part of the project management process. Oh man, plan well, that's a, I mean, that's a whole work stream right there. Uh, you know, it, I, and, and, and I'll take the chicken away out. I mean, you saw the, uh, the stage gate process, okay? If you look at that stage gate process, it's fairly robust. And you, you have to go through that process. I mean, you can't, I mean, you cannot just go out there and start doing it. I'll say this, you, you can't cowboy. And, and I did, you know, when I first started. We didn't have any kind of process when I first started working. But, I mean, it's, uh, it, it isn't something that I can share with you in, in a couple of minutes, but I'll, I'll, I'll say this. It starts with a, um, it starts with a scope document, okay? Um, it starts with who's going to be on your project team, who are the decision makers, okay? Uh, then it starts with a uh, process flow, then you have a process flow diagram, then you have P&IDs, then you have a project execution plan. So planning is really a melding of two things, the scope and how we're gonna execute the scope. Both of them are just as important. Unfortunately, people spend all their time on scope definition and owners do this, but no time on how we're gonna execute it. And that's where these things fail, especially in execute. And listen, if you're, interest, if you're interested in this, um, you know, typically we'd have, a, we'd have this, it's a one-week course, typically we would offer it right about now, but because of everything that's been going on, we've canceled it. Uh, we have an, a face-to-face -face course like this planned in, uh, in London toward the end of the year, so that may or may not work for you. If some of you have an interest, um, having a site, a, um, a, a course like this for your firm, we can do this and we can do it virtually, okay? So, and, and listen, if you're interested in other courses, um, you know, you, you can go to the website. I teach a turnaround management course, uh, construction management. I mean, there, there are a whole series of things. But I tell you, I think those of you that, are, that attended, I really appreciate you attending. I think you're smart to try to want to learn and uh, I just, I'm just, i just sorry, you know, I can't meet every one of you and shake your hand and say hello to you, but I wish you the best of luck, okay, and stay safe.